covered the first chapter in a previous show. I think one of the main points from there was the different types of inequality throughout history, because like the type of inequality that we are familiar with is a relatively recent phenomenon, pretty much from the advent of agriculture. And before then, in the Paleolithic era, the more tribal cultures, there was inequality, but it took a different form. It wasn't really the the vast economic inequalities that we see. It was more status-based. There were economic inequalities in certain situations, like we gave the example of tribes that lived on a, basically next to a rare resource, so it might be a, a prime river fishing location or something. So they'd basically get a, essentially a monopoly on that resource. And that resulted in a more stratified hierarchical form of inequality within those tribes. But on the whole, things were pretty much, um, well, more, more equal than any society after the advent of agriculture. And then once we get agriculture, that produces the the possibility for great inequality because now you have the possibility for surplus production. So once you have surplus production, it's a matter of who's going to control that and how are they going to control it. And for our entire history since then, it has been those... Uh, basically, it's been the people who can... The p people can control that and have it for themselves if they have the the power of, uh, of violence, essentially, to control it and to, to um, prevent any possible people from taking that. So, well, what you needed to do is you needed to protect that surplus with essentially a private military or uh, a police force or whatever. So there's, for, for the history of inequality and for the history of modern economics in the sense of, like, the last 10 years, there's been this... Um, this relationship, this almost intertwined relationship between wealth and um, possessing power, and that is like the the element of coercion and and the threat of violence and the use of violence. So there's been this link between violence and um, and wealth, and so that, like I said, allowed for a new form of inequality, like a a, a va uh, an inequality of a degree that wasn't even possible beforehand because now you have surplus surplus production you've got the potential to create and to hold on to a lot more than will just basically let you live a subsistence lifestyle but even then after that there are still variations in the types of inequality that we've seen since then so this second chapter that we're looking at looks at the roman and the various chinese empires around the same time period so um well, around 2,000 years ago and then, you know, before or after. And Scheidel points out the, the, mostly the similarities between those two systems, but also the differences. One of the things that stood out to me before getting into a lot of the details is that this was a form of inequality that, um, that, that doesn't have, well, it has some things in common, again, with, let's say, modern Western societies and even Eastern societies like China. But there's a difference um, back then because these were still pre-industrial societies. And so one of the points, well, I want to get into just a little bit of the background to understand the types of inequality that Scheidel is talking about. He gets into like Gini coefficients and things like that. So for those unfminiliar with that, Gini is a G-I-N-I. It's basically a, a measure of the like a society's resources and then how those are distributed. So if everyone has exactly the same amount, that would be a Gini distribution of like zero. But if one person has all the wealth, essentially, and everyone else is just at subsistence, that would be like a one. Or I, th I think that's the way it is. I'm not, or it, I don't know if it, I can't remember if one is one person has everything and everyone else will basically die. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, so basically, you can't, g in practice, you'll never get a Gini coefficient of one because most societies will, um, like the majority of people will be at a, at a subsistence level because they're essential for, for, well, you need those people at the bottom in order to hold up the people at the top. If everyone else dies and you're the only person with all the wealth, you're going to die too, essentially. So there's always, there's always, um, there's always some wealth at the bottom, even if it's just as, at a subsistence level. But 
there's another limiting factor on the the Gini coefficient, and this is um, he gets into it in, in the appendix. And what it basically means is that if you take a society, um, it depends on how much, or like a nation or whatever, it it depends on how much money and production that economy that yeah that economy produces. Because if you have, let's say, well, let's just take a hypothetical example of like this fictional country with a hundred people. So the GDP might be a hundred dollars. Um, and that, and so a perfectly distributed equal system, each person, each person gets or has $1, right? So everyone has one. Now, if you, if this, if the GDP is 101, then you have, you can have 99 people with $1 and then one person with $2. So that person has twice as much wealth as everyone else, but the, it's it's not a very big difference. The Gini coefficient is going to be really low because there's just not enough surplus to make a a, a big um, difference between the lowest and the top. So when you have let's say like a GDP of a million for these hundred people, and each person, ninety nine people are still making still only have one dollar, and then one other person has essentially you know just shy of a million dollars. That's a huge disparity, and a very high um, a very high inequality measure, Gini coefficient. So in a, basically what that shows is that the, the Gini coefficient is limited by the, the total wealth or production within any individual country. So the point he makes about these, uh, these empires, the Roman and the Chinese, was that because they were pre-industrial, like their GDP, their well, equivalent GDP, you know, trying to figure it out in terms of which we think about modern GDPs, wasn't very high. I think at one point he says that in the Roman Empire it was something like just maybe maybe two times um, like the subsistence level, and modern economies go several orders of magnitude higher than that above subsistence. So there wasn't a lot of there wasn't a lot of money relatively to go around. But the point he makes about about that is that in the Roman Republic, um, I'll just read a quote where he's talking about just the estimate he that he and others have come up with for the, um, the, the Gini of the, the Roman Republic, or may, and may, maybe up to the time of the empire too. But he basically says that during these periods, there were like a hundred and, what was it? Um, well, I'll, we've given the number, he's giving the number of households, and basically that about 1.5% 1, 1. of all health, of all households captured between a sixth and close to a third of the total output. And this equated to about um, a Gini in the low 0.4s. And a lot of modern societies, like Western societies, are in the mid 0.4s or even up to like low 0.5s. So it looks a, bit, a little bit low and comparable to modern uh, inequality. But he points out, that this value is actually much higher than it might seem. Because average per capita GDP amounted to only about twice minimum subsistence net of tax and investment, the projected level of Roman income inequality was not far below the maximum that was actually feasible at that level of economic development, a feature, sh a feature shared by many other pre-modern societies. Measured against the share of GDP that was available for extraction from primary producers, Roman inequality was therefore extremely severe. At most, a tenth of the population beyond the wealth elite would have been able to enjoy incomes well above bare subsistence minimum, or bare subsistence levels. So essentially, what you had in the in the Roman Republic and getting it, and even more so, I guess, in the Empire in the in the hundreds of years after the fall of the Republic was an extremely unequal system where the elite class had essentially everything. Um, like the top 12% had all the wealth. Everyone else was living bare subsistence. So this would be like pretty much below poverty levels in a lot of developed countries. <clears throat> and um, but so their Gini, like that was the maximum Gini they could possibly have in order to survive. If they were making modern GDPs, their Gini might have gone up to 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, because you, you can, um, bigger, richer societies have a higher capacity for inequality. Um, 
So that's something to just keep in mind in general for when thinking, when reading articles about inequality and Gini coefficients, is that there are factors that you have to take into account to provide the context for what that number actually means. Because you can have a, what seems to be a low Gini compared to other countries, but that that might mean that um, in uh, in essence, in practice, that that society might be vastly more more unequal than a, a country with a higher um, a higher Gini coefficient. Um, it depends on it, it. Really depends on how you look at it. So, uh, a developing country with a Gini of 0.4 that might mean that pretty much everyone is in total poverty, and a tiny percent of the population has everything. Whereas in a, a richer country, you can have the majority of the population at several times, or you know, maybe not several times, but significantly above the the poverty level and above subsistence levels, and then uh, like an even larger group that has even more of the or uh, an even more absolute number of of the of the wealth or amount of the wealth. So there there are all these different factors that you have to look at when thinking about inequality. You know, whether it's absolute or relative, or, and what the what the, the 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 GDP is of these countries, like per capita, all of these things, you have to be taken into account to understand it. So when you're looking at the the Roman and the Chinese empires of these times, um, you really get the picture that um, <clears throat> well, things were bad. It's like you think inequality is bad now <laughs> in the in a, an absolute like um, monarch monarchical uh, dictatorship. Things were uh, a lot more extreme, and in this chapter, he gives the he gives an explanation of how this happened, how this progressed, and again, part of it was has to do with you have these um, these surpluses of production. You have essentially extra food. You have grain. Who controls that? And then, um, well, who's going to control that? It's the person with the most power. Eventually, you get to this system, like in China, where the warring kingdoms uh, were united. And now you have this absolute, um, essentially this absolute government that has control over everything. And that those resources are then controlled by the might of the military. Um, and I don't know, do we want to get into details about... Uh, well, I, how that happened? I just wanted to jump in there because um, what's interesting about this chapter, uh, that, like you said, focuses on um, the inequality within empires, is that most often, uh, if there was any attempt to um, create uh, greater equalization and uh, mm -hmm. and less income inequality, it most often took the form of uh, elitist infighting. In other words. Uh, occasionally, you had a revolt among the, uh, the the peasant class here and there, especially in the in the Chinese Empire, um, and in the Roman Empire, you you did have um, a kind of uh, you know working class um, struggle, if you want to call it that, sort of uh, supporting those uh, those senators and those individuals who would you know like the Gracchi brothers uh, who who would push forward with agrarian bills. Uh, but most often, the, the biggest leveling we saw of any kind wasn't really a leveling at all. It was, it was more, um, you know, one, one group of uh, uh, semi-militarized political class families, aristocrats, who were fighting and usurping the, the, other, uh, the other factions. And, and they would take turns over a period of hundreds of years um, you know, toppling one another. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, you know, taking a step back from it, the impression I got was that um, the 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 working class or the or the slaves or the peasantry uh, were quite often so disenfranchised, so um, so afar from wielding any kind of uh, economic or political power that they they didn't even have the opportunity or the means uh, or a hint of it to um, uh, put forward any kind of viable way of, of maintaining a, a more equal distribution mm -hmm. of wealth. Uh, so this was, um, this was a, a, an interesting part of it to me um, because, you know, what we learn uh, from Shadell's book, at least in, in this part of it, is that, there, there, 
there was no opportunity for many individuals to to create a uh, any kind of lasting and um, and uh, viable distribution of wealth, as I just said. It, it was just it was just a kind of uh, a permanent underclass of disenfranchised individuals who were existing as farmers or or merchants or craftsmen, really much at the at the whims of whoever was then in power. Um, and also, uh, to put a point on it, um, you know, we, like you said, ours, and these are, these are empires we're talking about. So, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the power that was held by the governments at the time was at the force of a military or a police state, uh, so to say, who, who had been administrative control over the courts and who were able to tax and uh, individuals and confiscate their land or redistribute it as they saw fit. Um, and it, it could have only been accomplished uh, with the power of, of brute strength and force. So, you know, as we, as we kind of look at contemporary times a little bit, um, there are some differences, but certainly some parallels, I think, on a, on a global scale of, you know, what an empire uh, looks like and how it behaves and, uh, and what it does. And when you compare these, these empires to what, you know, some might consider the Western empire, um, and you look at the same dynamics involved, it, it, there's not much has changed in thousands of years. The same dynamics seem to be at play. Uh, there's this, you know, the vassal states and, 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 uh, and countries that, um, that have been kind of forcibly, uh, manipulated and coerced to do the bidding of these, uh, militarized, um, big bully, you know, countries. I'd say maybe one thing I just want to riff on that point really quick was the um, is the idea that yeah like nothing really has changed in that in that way but it's like people's perspective on it has changed and I mean economically technologically a lot has changed sure but and people expect the state or the government um, you know to to do something good for the people. You know, there's something good about government. Government can come in and legalize things and prohibit this, prohibit that. You know, it can, you know, protect you or, you know, protect you from the evildoers or whatever. There's something about government that is, um, that can be good. And that's a concept that's pretty relatively new. I mean, it probably dates back to like the, you know, the revolutions, the revolutionaries, the, you know, John Locke and Thomas Hume and all those philosophers and kind of a more modern um, way of viewing the individual and the social contract and that we are all in this together and that there are some values that are higher than us or the government and that there is something objectively and absolutely true about justice and it doesn't depend on the whims of those in power. So, there's some sort of shared sentiment there, but deep down, I mean, like you're saying, I think that everything is pretty much functions, uh, especially behind the scenes, and then it's just kind of sugar-coated for mass consumption in the same way. I just want to read um, what Walter Scheidel had to write about that. Um, he writes that, um, from a contemporary perspective, states are considered to be failing if they are unable to supply public goods to their members. Corruption, lack of security, breakdown of public services and infrastructure, and loss of legitimacy serve as markers of state failure. Yet this definition holds states to standards that need not have applied in the more distant past. The notion that states are supposed to provide varied public goods beyond basic security and that failure or collapse can be inferred from their inability to meet this expectation seems anachronistic for most of history. For the uh, purposes of this global survey, survey, we are better served by a bare-bones characterization of essential state functions. Inasmuch as pre-modern polities focused in the first instance on checking internal and external challengers, protecting the key allies and associates of rulers, and extracting the revenues required to perform these tasks and enrich the power elite, state failure is best understood as the loss of the capacity to accomplish these basic objectives. So it all revolves around um, 
a small power elite, a small group that has shared goals, shared interests, which is to enrich themselves, to gain power, to thwart external enemies. And there's, if you do what you have to do to keep the, the plebes happy or whatever, to keep, you know, if you, if there's, if you're not strong enough that you can't just brutally, um, thwart them and enslave them like they did in Barbados when they would just work people to death and slave uh, and chain gangs, then, you know, you've got bread and circuses or whatever to keep people at least pacified. And the entire way you're raking in billions and billions and billions and you're owning, you're buying up land and buying up land and you're just doing whatever you can to make sure that you and you, and your own are set up, um, you know, as far into the future as possible. But the problem is, is that, you know, then you're in that position and you have a big target on your back so you're it's constantly live by the sword and die by the sword as he shows throughout the book but the interesting thing is that no matter how many times an elite family loses all of they all that they have to another elite family the general that general state continues to grow and it continues to become more powerful and continues to increase the inequality levels and the Gini coefficient there to um, the breaking point. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, it doesn't really matter who's the, you know, the meet the old boss, same as the new or new boss, same as the old Mm -hmm. boss, the same, um, the same thing continues to happen. And on a deep level, I think that one reason why people are so anxious about levels of high inequality is that when it gets really bad, you know, it's, kind of like a harbinger of doom you know the great you know what is the name of the book the great level great leveler violence um he talks about the four horsemen uh you know mass mobilization warfare revolution state failure and lethal pandemics and state failure can come about because of massive climate disruptions and all that kind of stuff it's usually when there's a lot a lot of inequality then for some whatever reason it's like something clicks and then boom everything starts crashing down to the ground for whatever reason mm-hmm. right 